Hey. Whatever happens, let's do it together. Kind of let it touch, kind of let it just touch the bottom of your chin, barely. Okay. Not like, not like that, or you know. Just okay. Good morning, everybody. Well, welcome to worship today. It's a good, good day. And uh, we're go you're going to be blessed this morning. You'll hear a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. But if you're, if you're coming in, come on in and sit down. Welcome to, welcome to church this morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, let me say again to those of you, that, actually I haven't said it yet, but let me say to those of you that may be our special guest today at First Baptist Church. My name's Sean. I'm the pastor here. But let me say to you all, thank you for being here. Uh, and we have something we like to give every guest. Um, you'll either get it on your way in or get it on your way out. But we have a little mug with some information about our church inside. And uh, we just want you to know that we're glad that you're here. And this week, uh, inside of the mug, there is like a, a tall card that says connect on it. It's got blue on it. There's also some of the same cards on the back side of the pew in front of you. If you'll take that and fill that out. And when you're done, when we finished here today, you, if you could just leave that in the pew right where, you're, right where you've been seated. Uh, we have some folks that will come around and pick that up. We want to pray for you by name. We want to pray for your family by name. So if you have any prayer requests at all, you can also write that on the card. And when we meet together as a church staff, we'll pray for you. And this week, we'll just make sure that you know, once again, that we were glad that you were here, that you were our guest. And church members, listen, if you have a prayer request, same thing for you. Write that request on there, and we will pray for it personally, by name. Uh, whatever you need, you let us know. So welcome to worship this morning. Well, we have just a couple of announcements this morning before we move on. Um, first, I want to remind our, our students, our teenagers, that we're going to be having a, uh, a bowling night coming up. And uh, all the information is on your screen. All the information is in the bulletin. So I won't give it all. I won't say it all again. But it's coming up this Saturday. If you'd like to come, check the information out. If you, if you need more answers than what we have to give, then reach out to me or reach out to my wife, one of us, and we'll get you whatever you need. 
Um, second of all, I wanted to say this. In the area of missions, we told you a couple of weeks ago that we had a, we had a donor that said uh, what we had left remaining from our missions offering. We had almost, we had almost our goal met. We had just a short bit. We had a donor call and say, hey, listen, I'm willing to match someone not even a part of our body. Uh, I'm willing to match the, the remaining amount if people will give. And you all were faithful and you gave and the goal was reached. And so we have that amount now, the total amount that we offered, which was $16,000, which was our goal. So I just want to give God praise for that. He's really good. He's really good, and uh, thank you for being faithful, and thank you for being faithful in your prayers. Thank you for being faithful in your giving. Well, that's the two announcements that I have, and uh, Jonathan is seated over there this morning. Uh, but we all had a kind of a unified Sunday school this morning, so we were all in one room this morning together. Uh, but he said he wanted, he counted his best guesstimate, whatever it is. He said there were about 149 of you present this morning in Sunday school. So thank you for being here. And as if he were up here, he would remind you, we have it at Sunday school again next week at 945. Um, if you've been coming for a while, maybe you've been a guest for a while, you've been in worship with us every week, but you haven't joined or been part of a, a Sunday school class, which is really like a small Bible study group. It's really like a fellowship group. And that's, that's your family. Those are the people that you can call on when you need help. And that's where you can kind of ask those questions that you might not be able to ask in here. I want to encourage every person to join and be a part of a Sunday school group, okay? So you do that, and, uh, and I promise you, you'll be blessed, and you'll have some deep relationships here. And with that said, what I want to do is I want to pray, and uh, I'll come back up in just a little bit later and uh, share with you just a little bit about our guest that will be sharing with you this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, we come together, and we bow our heads, and we praise you. We thank you that you are the God uh, who made everything, and we thank you that you are also the God who cared enough for us, even despite our sinfulness, despite our own waywardness, despite the fact that we rebelled against you. You are a God who loves us so much that you made a way for us to have a relationship with you, and you did that through your son Jesus. So we praise you, and we praise Jesus this morning. And it's our desire to lift up his name today and make him known. So, Father, we want to ask you, Lord, to be the leader of our worship time this morning. But we also want you to come to, to work in our hearts, in us and through us, so that you are truly glorified as we praise you today in song and as we listen to your word being preached. Father, we want to lift up our preacher this morning, and we want to pray that you would fill him with the Spirit of God so that whatever he speaks, whatever of your word that he speaks to us this morning, Lord, that we would be transformed, Lord, not as was mentioned earlier, not just another, uh, not just some more knowledge in our head, but Lord, uh, a lifestyle, a commitment to follow Christ, a changed life. So we ask for that today. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you. We thank you for your church. We thank you for this gathering time that you've allowed us to come and be together. You are truly good to us. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, amen. Good to see you, church. We are excited about what's happening in our choir, and we meet at 445 this afternoon. We'd love to see you there. If you've never been in choir before, this is a great time to step up and do it. Next Sunday, we're going to sing the song, He Is Here, and so we'll be getting ready for that. And then we meet at 9 o'clock next Sunday morning up here, and so join us at 445. We're going to do some gospel this morning. You ready? Stand up, if you will. Once we lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. That little light will never fill my soul. It made my heart in love and wrote my name above. Just the love when Jesus made me born. Now let us have a little love with Jesus. Let us have a little
When's the last time you did that song in church? Or this one? separation is the definition but this is a verb which means God's God cleaves to us we hide ourselves in him he is our rock and our fortress he's our sustainer so we're going to sing this uh, ver first verse again as a prayer and I want you to think about that rock of ages cleave to me or cleft for me and then brother Bill's going to come and lead us in a prayer Rock 
We do praise our Heavenly Father that we're able to be here this morning to worship Him. Come this morning, we hear this messenger bring a message, which in the Sunday school hour blessed our hearts immensely, and in the worship service, I'm sure, will do the same. Good to be saved. Good to be a child of the King. Good to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Indeed, the Word of God tells us in the book of Isaiah, the 30. 41st chapter, that 10th verse, so do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I will lift you up. I will strengthen you. We praise God for that. He loved us so that he sent his son to give his life on the cross of Calvary, that we might have the precious gift of eternal salvation. Let us pray. Our dear, most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, it is good to be here this morning. Lord, good to know that you are our God. Lord, you stand with us. You'll uphold us with your righteous right hand. Lord, your precious holy name be glorified completely. We pray, Lord, as we continue through this service, the moving of the Holy Spirit, Lord, upon each one present, Lord, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they would see their need of salvation. We love you. Our desire is to serve you, to be in your precious, perfect will. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son. Amen. Amen.
showed me what it means. I'm about to say. Sing it out. He was a bruise for our iniquities. The check of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Death was arrested. We became free because of what Jesus did for us. You believe that today? Oh, your grace, so free. 
seated. We have a, a guest today, so I'm not going to preach. Amen. But I was stuck. <laughs> Get out of here. Listen, I was thinking about it, though, as we were singing. I was reading this morning because I knew we were going to be discussing God's work all around the world. And we would hear about it in Sunday school, and we'd hear about it again in our time of worship together. And I was reading Psalm 96. And... Uh, you know, declare the wondrous works of our God, and it's declare the works all over the world, all over the earth, you know. And he, but he makes this connection. He's talking about the global God that we serve, the God of everywhere, the God of all nations, and he connects singing uh, to that in that passage. He said we sing and we declare and we ascribe to God the glory that is his. You know, we sing, I mean, I get caught up in it sometimes, and I'm just thinking, you know, I, I mean, I have a horrible voice. and do, does, None of that doesn't matter, right? But I'm singing to Jesus at that moment. But we're also declaring war when we sing. We're declaring war on the forces all around, the unseen forces that surround us that would keep people from knowing Jesus. And one day we're going to sing forever and ever in His sight. So I get pretty excited about that. Well, I want to introduce our guest to you. Jason's going to come just a minute. He and his wife... Karen, and they, they serve our denomination's uh, missionary agency, and they, they work in the Eastern European area. Um, many, of you, many of you were able to be here this morning during the Sunday school hour, and you heard some more specific details on that. But uh, Jason's going to come and share the word with us, and uh, I'm sure that uh, he's going to bring some insights from Scripture that are, that, that are well needed. And I hope you're like me, you prayed up, you're ready to receive what God has for you this morning. Uh, so that we can go out and be uh, the people that take Jesus to wherever he calls us to take Jesus to. So, brother, I'm going to pray for you, and then you come. Father, I pray for this brother, this good brother in Christ that I've had the opportunity to know in a very short time. I pray, Lord, that you would fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit today as he preaches the word of God. Use him powerfully today, not for his glory, but for your glory, God. And I pray today that Jesus would be exalted above any name that is named today. And uh, I pray that you would bless his ministry. Uh, I pray you bless the ministry of your work going out everywhere. And I pray, God, that we, your people here today, uh, would worship you in an even more intense way because we've been here today. Uh, thank you for this church. Thank you for this time to gather together. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, brother. I was surprised there weren't more amens when you said you weren't preaching. <laughs> that means they love you. That means that the preaching's good. And so I, I appreciate, I know how hard it is having served Southern Baptist churches for 25 years before we left for Europe. I know how hard it is to give up your pulpit. So I, I appreciate it. And I uh, want to invite you to join uh, me in the scriptures this morning in 2 Corinthians as we dive into... Um, Something I think is important for all of us. Now, as, as, as you've already heard, my wife and I, Karen, we live in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, we're here right now uh, doing some family stuff. Uh, Mom and my brother and sister-in-law and Doodlebug, they all live here in the, the Maybank area. Um, I've got family. I'm not usually having family when I'm preaching, so I get to pick on people, uh, which is nice. Um, so uh, we're here getting to spend some time with family, but also uh, getting to connect with churches like yours to be able to say thank you. Um, the announcement about the mission offering this morning is, is really exciting. And um, as people who are supported by you, let me say thank you. Thank you for the way you give. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for the way that you're ensuring that the gospel goes around the globe. Um, about 12 years ago, my wife and I, along with our two kids who were 9 and 11 at the time, left for North Germany where we, as your sent out ones, joined in the work of seeing the gospel go around the globe. And you know what I found out when I got there? It was weird because I grew up Southern Baptist, and I grew up where um, we didn't have high school Baptist young men, so I was an act teen. Anybody familiar with the, that's the girls' mission organization? <laughs> the lady that took me to church was the leader, and so I was just sitting there with all the girls. Of course, the guys made fun of me, but you know what? I was sitting there with all the girls, and they were outside playing wall ball. So, you know, <laughs> but... 
you know, growing up Southern Baptist and, and our, our heritage, I mean, the thing that brings us together, the cooperative program, to cooperate for what? To cooperate that the gospel would circle the globe. That at some point, we would be able to see with our own eyes people from every tongue, tribe, and nation gathered around the throne worshiping the Lamb. Amen? And I thought, I'm going to go to the nations and do this, but you know what I found out when I got there? It was no different a calling than what I had here in the States and what you have. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Went from getting some amens to some omes, right? I mean, we lifted missionaries up when I was, you know, I was saved when I was 17, and, and, and long story short, it was all new to me. I didn't know how any of it worked. But I did know that periodically at the church where I was saved, these superheroes would come in. Special forces, frontliners, you know, they got all kinds of crazy names when you can't say the word missionary. And these people would come in and, and our church would just esteem and lift them up, talk about how great they are. And it's happened to us a couple times since we've been back. It's embarrassing, actually. It makes you feel a little weird because we've discovered you're the superheroes. And we are all serving a God who is the ultimate superhero to see his story told, not ours. Right? And so what I want to challenge us on this morning is to join in that calling by knowing who you really are in Christ and embracing the identity that he's given you as one of his own. The only difference between being someone who does the work overseas and someone who does the work here is location. That's it. In Acts, when Paul and Barnabas were set apart to do this work, it was, they were together with the brothers and sisters in Antioch. And it was there that the Holy Spirit said during a time of worship, prayer, and fasting, set apart Paul and Barnabas for a special work I have for them. But that didn't mean the Antioch church stopped doing what they were doing. Paul and Barnabas just took it on the road, so to speak. They were the, they were the traveling gospel show. And you know the story of Paul and Barnabas, and you know that out of their journeys the church was born, right? The church began to spread globally, and we saw from Jerusalem to Antioch and then to the world. But the work in Jerusalem didn't, Jerusalem didn't stop. The work in Antioch didn't stop. The work in Gun Barrel City doesn't stop because your dollars are flowing. So in 2 Corinthians, I want to debunk a verse. It, debunk is, a, is a, a, it's, it's not a fair phrase because it does mean what we often say. There's a famous verse in this passage we're going to look at, and it says, If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. Behold, what? The old is gone, the new has come. And we use that verse usually appropriately, but not to the, I mean, we use it well beyond what's intended. Because we'll tell people, if you'll just say yes to Jesus, he'll give you a brand new life. Is that true or false? It's true. But then we take it and we kind of turn it into, which means you're made new and everything's good, now go and be blessed. And what we find in this passage is with that new birth comes a new identity, and that new identity is not about you. And it is not about me. It is all about Jesus. And church, we do a disservice to people when we offer them a new life and let's just get rid of everything you feel bad about and everything you feel guilty about and everything that's holding you back and you can be this new thing. So pray this prayer, walk this aisle, get in this water and then everything's good. And that is not the gospel. The gospel is transformation that brings a new identity and a new master, and that transformation is that your life should every day look a little bit more like Jesus than it did the day before. And I'm going to just throw it out there. If it's been a while since you've been able to put your finger on how Jesus is doing in your life, maybe perk up a little bit this morning because i got good news for you. That can all change today. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you haven't had that new life yet, and this is also good news for you because it can start today. Jesus has an identity for you that is beyond what you can imagine. I'm a high school dropout. I didn't make it out of high school. In fact, uh, the principal at my school had told my mom that uh, she should be prepared for me to to go to prison at some point. (laughs) It's funny now. It wasn't funny then. He had half my wardrobe in his office the whole time I was in high school. I was a freshman for two and a half years, so it was probably a good thing that I headed on out. Um, (laughs) it's, It's not good. But the transformation that he brought in my life and the youth pastor who invested in me about, let's, let's do this thing, it wasn't about me saying goodbye to all the yucky stuff. I mean, it was. All the yucky stuff, I'll leave it behind. And this new identity, 
I was glad to swap my identity. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we think, I've got a pretty good life. Sometimes maybe you were on the, the cradle roll or you had a drug problem as a child. You were drugged to church. And you feel like, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know, you know, my life doesn't feel like it's changed much. Well, you know, you can find encouragement, but the, the thing is, have you swapped your identity? Because you have a new identity. The question is, are you living in it or not? And sometimes we buy into the lie that we're told that being a Christian today is hard. It's so hard. J Jesus said, if you're weary and burdened, heavy laden, come to me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we believe it's easier to live like the world than living like Jesus, we've bought into a lie. Because the easiest way to live is with Jesus. In that identity. Not serving the old dead identity that you drag around. When Paul talked about it, he talked about, why do I, foolish man that I am, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? He, he's painting this picture of he's dragging his old dead corpse around, asking it, what do you want to do today? And that identity is dead. And it just makes no sense to talk to it. And yet you find yourself going, yeah, we used to like this. We used to like going here. We used to like doing this. And that old identity just goes. And yet we don't clue in. Jesus has something amazing for us. This transformation of being made new. It's what we preach. It's what we proclaim. It's what we share all around the globe. It's the consistent message of the gospel. Good news. You can be redeemed. You can be reconciled. And that's where we're going this morning. So in 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to start in verse 14. And we're going to go down through the end of the chapter, close to the end of the chapter. In verse 14, it says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all. Now catch this. This is what I've been talking about. And he died for all, that those who live, who is that? That's us, right? We've concluded that because Jesus died, all have died. So who is that? That's everyone who's in Jesus. If you're in Jesus, you have died. And we have concluded that this one who died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Holy cow. We could just stop right there and give an altar call, couldn't we? Who guides your day when you put your feet on the floor? That they no longer live for themselves, but for him for theirs, who for their sake died and was raised. You know, it's funny because um, my wife and I, we're in a leadership position in our organization. We have <coughs> about 130 adults that we lead. Now, we don't lead them directly because we have a team that we lead, and then that team leads team leaders, and those team leaders lead teams <coughs> so we've got um, we've got indirect connection to 130 but that gives us an opportunity about four or five times a year to talk to all of them and we work in Europe and across Europe we've got about 1100 people and occasionally we get to talk with them and we come back to this theme anytime I can remind them we take the gospel to hard places we are messengers as it was said this morning the good news and if you as a sent out one are not sure about your team's strategy, you're not sure what you should be doing today, you woke up this morning and it just feels like a bad day, I got good news for you. God has given you a purpose. Put your feet on the floor, walk out the door, and share the good news with somebody. Did you know Gun Barrel City is more ready to hear the gospel than we are to share it with them? Barna statistics have shown people are twice as likely to say yes if you'll ask them. <laughs> That's a weird statistic because if you don't ask them, you feel like they can't say no, but somehow some people figured it out, right? We've got to ask them. What did Paul say in Romans? How shall they hear if we don't go? Faith comes by hearing, the proclamation of the word. Folks, that is what we do. It feels like as sent out ones, that should be obvious, but it's not always obvious to our sent out ones, to the families that we lead. But as people who have died with Jesus and been raised to this new life, not for themselves, but for him, that should be obvious to all of us, that he has a purpose for you. I was uh, watching this video yesterday on, on the internet, of course, and it's this radio DJ, and he's, he's not a believer, and he's, he's doing an interview with these two people, and 
he asks the question, <clears throat> if I were to offer you $10 million, would you accept it? And the two interviewees said, yes, in a heartbeat. I'll take it in a heartbeat. And he said, okay, but there's only one catch. I'm going to give you this $10 million, but when you go to bed tonight, it's the end of your life. You don't get tomorrow. And both those people said, well, then absolutely not. I would not take $10 million if it meant that I had what's left of today and that's it. And the guy doing the interview said, so what you're saying is the privilege of waking up tomorrow is worth more than $10 million to you. Now think about that and let that sink in because we have a treasure that's far more valuable than $10 million. We have a message that brings eternal hope. You know what? You can run out of $10 million. Look at all of the professional athletes who have squandered their millions of dollars on junk, on self-gratification. Folks, you carry a message that when people receive it means eternal change. We have to decide first what Paul's pointing to the Corinthian church here to. Who do we wake up for in the morning? Do we realize that this new life that Jesus has given us, as we sang about, sometimes we want to sing that line, you've made me new. And we skip the line that says, now life belong, begins with you. Does our life really begin with him? Do we wake up in the morning, spin out of bed, thankful that we have more, a more valuable message than $10 million, with purpose in our feet and pride in our stride, head out the door with a message we know will transform the world. First, you have been given a purpose. That purpose comes through in an identity as we read further on. Our purpose brings us to this point. So from now on, therefore, I love the word therefore. Anytime you see therefore in scriptures, you know what that means? Look back. Because Paul or whoever's writing has just made a brilliant theological point and now they're, here comes the meat. The brilliant theological point is you don't live for yourself anymore. We see this in the Great Commission, right? Trick question that I often pose to people is, where, what's the first word of the Great Commission? And you would say, go. The first word is all authority, or the first two words, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. Oh, there's that word therefore, right? So we get some marching orders, we get some practical direction based on a theological truth that Jesus is all authority in the Great Commission. In this passage, our lives don't belong to us, this new life we received, we've received from him. Therefore, and here comes the practical application. You, you tracking with me? This means yes, I'm not asleep. All right? We have purpose because Jesus is the one who we died with and now we live for. And here's how it looks. Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Weird. Weird, right? How do you regard someone according to the flesh? Now think about it. How did you look at people before you knew Jesus? Were they an inconvenience? A moment of transparent confession here. When I get behind the wheel, I tend to look at people in the flesh. Because every idiot on the road is cutting me off and getting in my way, and don't they know I got places to be, and how dare they speed up to get in front of me? I've gone to meddling. <laughs> Sorry. There are moments in our Christian life where we still try to regard people according to the flesh, and Paul says that is not who you are anymore. You don't see the world around you the way you used to. You can't see the world around you the way you used to. Because you've got a new identity. And he's going to tell us here in a second, because you've been made new, and this is where that made new comes in, we have to see the world around us as spiritual people would see the world around us. How does Jesus see the world around us? How does Jesus see the cashier at the grocery store who's taken too long? How does Jesus see your neighbor? This is, you know, I'm a city boy. I grew up in South Dallas. I grew up in DeSoto. We lived in Lubbock for a long time, but Lubbock's 350,000 people, so I mean, it's not like living in the country. Now, I've lived in some country places too and done some roping and some wrangling and some rattlesnake roundup stuff. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a city boy. Hamburg, we lived there, five and a half million. Budapest, five and a half million. So where we're living now is different. We live out near, and I know to say it, Falby, 
right? Because that's how low, it's not Falba, it's Falby. We live out that direction, what, about 10 miles north of here? In kind of a little family compound where there's gunfire <laughs> and bonfires and roving packs of dogs. and It's the Wild West out there. I don't mind telling you. I don't mind telling you. And it's real easy when you're trying to sleep and there's a cow mooing outside your window to start reacting in the flesh. Or when someone's out shooting a gun or blowing up Tannerite. And we, somebody blew up Tannerite near us and the whole house shook. I was like, what was that? My brother said, ah, that happens all the time. I'm like, what? It's crazy. Don't these people know that it's dangerous and we got to live here and da-da-da? And all of a sudden, I'm not thinking, wow, oh, of course lost people would do that. Uh, saved people might do that. <laughs> but all I'm thinking about is me and the inconvenience to me. And I'm setting the gospel in the back seat, and I'm not thinking a lick about that person needs Jesus. And I could be that person if I wasn't so annoyed and so self-centered and caught up in how I'm feeling right now. Oh, my goodness, the flesh. The flesh will remain our enemy until we are made perfect in Jesus, in his presence. We have to fight against it. We have to fight against it. We cannot regard anyone any longer according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Would you look at Jesus and say, how dare you wake me up early in the morning? Would you look at Jesus and say, how dare you cut me off in traffic? Paul saying that same, that same understanding of how Jesus works. We need to function that way in our relationships with everybody. Jesus even said this. What's the greatest commandment? Come on, you can interact. Come on, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? I'm not a math wizard, but in algebra, in some math, when you say and this thing is like that thing, that means that they're equal. And Jesus says, and the second is like it. What? Love your neighbor as yourself. A few ch chapters before that, Jesus said, hey, when you visited me in prison, I was thankful. When you brought me clothing, when I was naked, I was thankful. When you fed me, when I was hungry, I was, I was so thankful. And they're like, when did we see you? And he said, that which you do the least of these brothers of mine. You mean, listen, our act of worship, this is corporate worship, this is good, but our act of worship is how we treat the cashier. Our act of worship is how we treat the neighbor. Our act of worship is getting out of the flesh and getting into the spirit and with spiritual eyes seeing an opportunity to worship by pouring Jesus out on people. This is what your sent out ones are doing everywhere we go. We're doing a lot of humanitarian work in the countries we work in. Um, in the Sunday school hours, I was able to show you there's a big war going on where we are. And we're, I mean, we've, we're running $2 million worth of humanitarian aid projects right now. And not a single one of those projects is about the humanitarian aid. I mean, they are. Don't get me wrong. Jesus wants us to love people. And he wants us all in. But every one of those projects is about the gospel. Every one of those projects is about seeing those people with spiritual eyes and not just seeing the needs that they have in the moment, but seeing the need they have for eternity. First Baptist Church, you have the same calling right here in Gun Barrel City. What a privilege we have to be gospel messengers. Paul goes on, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. That means if you are saved, you have no excuse. You know, as Baptists, we say once saved, always saved. I like to say if saved, always saved. Because I do know it's possible to be a member of a club and not be saved. I served in Southern Baptist churches in Texas for 25 years. I've seen people who their hearts, were, their hearts were, they're good people, they really mean well, but when you start talking about Jesus and personal growth and discipleship, they're, they're as lost as any lost person that you've ever come across. But they've been members of the church for a long time. So being a member on a roll somewhere doesn't make you any more saved than being a, sleeping in a garage makes you a car. The evidence is in the fruit. The evidence is in the fruit. How you doing? Good news. Jesus wants to do more. He wants to do more with you. 
And he wants to give you more purpose and more meaning. He wants to put you on this path to use you for amazing things. And this is why he's made you new. This is why he's made you new for his glory, for his kingdom, for his purpose. That's what all of this up before the first therefore of verse 17 is about. Therefore, he made you new. So what does this mean? Well, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's a long word. That means the ministry of putting things back together. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, I love that word, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Woo! Come on. You are an ambassador for Christ. You're an ambassador for Christ. This room is full of ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? You get to see this. It's not like the movies, okay? You see in the movies where, you know, it's the former Soviet Union and the American spy or whoever's running and the Russian spies are chasing them. They're just trying to get to the gates of the embassy with their passport out screaming, I'm an American! Right? And soldiers stand there waiting. Actually, it's local police that guard the outside of the embassies first. You have to get through them before you get inside. and You can't just run up if you come running up, especially waving and screaming. You're probably not going to run much further. But once you're inside, wow, it's a little piece of America no matter where you are. When we moved overseas, you know, your passport's good for 10 years, but if your children are under the age of 16, your passport's good for five years. Their passports are good for five years. So we had to take our kids to renew passports. We had to go and renew our passports. And as soon as you pass the clearance of the local police in Germany, it was the German police, and in Budapest it's the Hungarian police, you are greeted and welcomed in, and it's like there's American flags and people speaking English, and hey, would you like some coffee? Would you like some water? Come on in. We're so glad you're here. You're why we exist. We represent America here on this continent. Folks, do people have that experience when they come into your presence? Because where you stand as an ambassador is a little piece of heaven. It is the kingdom of heaven come to earth in the person of Jesus and born in you through the Holy Spirit in this made new presence that you now have. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are his presence. And when people come running to you, help, I'm in trouble. Help, I'm being oppressed. Help, the life is just horrible. And you say, well, come on in. I'm glad you're here. Let me welcome you and tell you how you can be welcomed into the kingdom. That's what ambassadors do. They represent their home of origin in a different place. This is not our home. You are a pilgrim, a stranger, a traveler passing through this world where every footstep is a step of the kingdom of heaven. Come to earth for people to be redeemed. This is why Paul says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's our message as ambassadors. You don't have to be lost anymore. Everything has been done that you might be put back together with Jesus. Amen. It's easy to forget that sometimes, that fire that you had when you were first following Jesus. When I was a, when I was, <clears throat> when I was a teenager and had just come to faith, they had this gospel tract called the answer tract some of you might be the right age to remember it folded out into a cross and it had the gospel it had the, the plan of salvation in it and it's you know this 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 deal and i thought it'd be cool i'd sneak into the stalls at the high school and i'd roll them up into the toilet roll the toilet paper roll in the bathrooms so about every 10 squares a gospel track would pop out i know right i, I don't know what i was thinking but you know what, I was excited and knew I had a message that others needed to hear and I wanted to just figure out how can I get it out there. It was later I realized that the gospel goes forward really through relationships. Whether it's a brand new relationship with someone you just met or a deep, long, lifelong relationship you've got, the gospel goes forward through relationships because the gospel comes by hearing. So we've got to speak. We've got to speak the message of our kingdom 
We've got to speak this message of reconciliation. You don't have to be separate from God anymore. Jesus has done all the work to put you back there. Listen, folks, if that's a new message to you this morning, in just a second, Sean's going to be here at the front. I want you to come down and tell him that's a new message and I want that. But I'm, I'm going on the, 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 the hunch that the majority of you here would say that you are part of the redeemed. That you've been made new. And you are ambassadors. And that this appeal to others to be reconciled to God is something that ought to be present in your life. So this, we're going to, when we start the invitation here in just a second, I want to invite you to come to the front and say to your pastor, or come as a family and kneel at the altar and say, we, we're going to embrace this identity. We have a purpose and we have an identity and it's all wrapped up in Jesus and it's all wrapped up in this new person that he made us. And to not live that way to not live that way is to say, I don't value it. It's not as meaningful to me. It's easy to, I, listen, it's easy to get distracted. I know it's hard to imagine that as someone who was sent out to do this to the nations, that there would be discouraging days where you just don't feel like you could talk to another person who's going to tell you no. We discovered in Hamburg, Germany, we had to talk to 100 people before we'd find one person interested in having a spiritual conversation. And it would take about 25 or 30 of those before one person might say, yeah, I'm willing to meet with you and learn more. And out of those, another one out of 30. So we'd have to talk to one out of 100 to get a spiritual interest, another one out of 100 to find someone who'd say yes to Jesus. And that's discouraging. And that is, it's kind of heartbreaking until you realize, well, then I better talk to a lot more people. If it's going to take 100 to get to one, I better talk to 200 tomorrow because I've got to get to two because the world needs this message. It's worth more than $10 million, and I may not wake up tomorrow. Did I use my day today well? Was I an ambassador in this moment? What, which restaurant is it that says there's free tacos tomorrow? Was it down here, the uh, jalapeno tree? Free tacos tomorrow. Hey, tomorrow never comes. That's why they can put that up, right? This is a change that needs to happen today. This is a change that needs to happen today. You're going to leave here and a lot of you are going to go to lunch somewhere and you're going to run into lost people. You're going to run into people who are running for an embassy somewhere just looking for a safe haven. They're looking for being made complete and whole. And you are the messenger that God put in their path today. And without you, I was, I was, I was talking with a group of students last week in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And just the irony of Jesus ascending to heaven and angel Michael meeting him and saying all right Jesus what's next and Jesus says what's up to them and Michael says what's plan B and Jesus says there is no plan B this is the plan just the the irony of because we're, we're messed up people right and but you, you're not you're people who've been redeemed and we deal with mess and we deal with stress and we deal with this world but you have been redeemed and you have been made new and you have been given a purpose and you have been given an identity and to not live in that is why things feel so broken. Man, if you could wake up in the morning knowing, I don't care what else I'm doing today, God left me here to be good news to somebody. That changes the whole complexion of your day and your life. Will you make that change this morning? Will you say to your pastor, hold me accountable? Will you come say to your pastor, I want that new life? Will you come as a family and say, we are ambassadors and we're going to march together to take this message to those who need to hear? Let me pray for us. Father, I'm thankful that, uh, wow, that <laughs> so many years ago there was a group of teenagers in my high school who didn't see me according to the flesh. They didn't see their lives as something to hold on to. They accepted the challenge of their youth pastor to go to school and make disciples. And there I was. And they were brave and they were faithful. And you changed my life. You gave purpose and meaning where there were none.
And here we are 36 years later. And that purpose and meaning hasn't changed. It's grown richer and it's grown deeper. And I'm so thankful for that. And Father, forgive me for the times when I deny that. And forgive me for the times when I rebel against that. And forgive me for the times I push back. And I pray that for my brothers and sisters here in this room, Father. Draw them to you in this moment. Breathe life into them that they might be renewed and restored in their pursuit of you and being obedient to your word and being ambassadors of your good news of sharing the message of reconciliation with a world that needs to hear it. Father, come and have your way with us, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand together as we enter this time of invitation. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love amen well I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go be an ambassador. Uh, I get, uh, I love that word, and uh, <clears throat> I'm reminded of how serious, uh, how serious this thing is. People's eternity, man. God saved us, and we have the we have the same good news that we can go tell somebody else. So thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you for serving the Lord. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you for sharing with us today. Um, I want to remind everybody, those of you that are involved in, your, in our book studies, we'll meet tonight, 6 o'clock. Hope to see each one of you there. Um, uh, Jason will probably can hang out right up here for a few minutes if you want to come share with him. Uh, God may have led you to say something to him. I don't know. Hug his neck, love him, encourage him uh, and his family. If they're able, they'll be up here. Meet them. And uh, other than that, I, I really don't have much else to say other than let's go do what God has told us to do. And with that said, brothers and sisters, uh, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, again, Lord, this word that was preached, may we receive it uh, as if it's come from heaven itself because it's come, it is your word, it is truth, sent through this brother, this messenger. Lord, help us to be the ambassadors that you call us to be. Strengthen us to do it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that we have been crucified with you and now you live within us in resurrection power. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.